Welcome to our evening service video. Thank you for joining us in this way again. Let's pray. Lord God, we do want to thank you for bringing us together again in this way. As we often say, we know it's not the same as meeting in person, but we thank you that we still have this opportunity. Uh, and we praise you, Lord, for the freedom that we have uh, to worship together and to uh, put these services on the internet and uh, to be able to watch them uh, without interference. Lord, we thank you uh, because we acknowledge that there are some in some parts of the, of the world that aren't able to do that. So we count that as a blessing, Lord. We thank you for it. And uh, Lord, we ask that as we start our service tonight, you would quieten our hearts before you now, that you would draw near to us, helping us to be able to concentrate, to uh, clear our minds of distractions. Uh, Lord, may we be able to uh, focus as we sing, as we read, as we pray, as we listen. Uh, Lord, may we learn, help us to join in with this service with real sincerity and indeed with a real desire to hear you speaking uh, and a desire to know your blessing. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, our first hymn is, uh, the words are going to be on the screen, of course. Uh, Come praise and glorify our God, the Father of our Lord. In Christ he has in heavenly realms his blessings on us poured. Come praise and glorify our God, the Father of our Lord. Christ, he has in heavenly realms his blessings on us for. For pure and blameless in his sight, he destined us to be. And now we've been adopted through his Son eternal. like to open your Bibles and turn to Psalm 4 
and uh, as uh, is the practice now for some of our readings at least uh, you need to look it up for yourself it is in the um, powerpoint pdfs if you receive that along with the link for this video um, but hopefully you've got your own bible at home so you can look it up there and uh, we'll be able to watch in this case it's jacob who is going to do the reading for us from psalm 4. Uh, so the reading is from psalm chapter 4 starting from verse 1. For the director of music, with stringed instruments, a psalm of David. Answer me when I call to you, my righteous God. Give me relief from my distress. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. How long will you people turn my glory into shame? How long will you love delusions and seek false gods? Know that the Lord has set apart his faithful servant for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. Tremble and do not sin when you are on your beds. Search your hearts and be silent. Offer the sacrifices of the righteous and trust in the Lord. Many, Lord, are asking, who will bring us prosperity? Let the light of your face shine on us. Fill my heart with joy when their grain and new wine abound. In peace I will lie down and sleep. For you alone, Lord, make me dwell in safety. Thank you for that reading, Jacob. And in case anyone was wondering, that was uh, from the 2011 NIV. Well, we're going to sing again, and it's uh, another one where we're going to have the uh, older words, traditional words uh, on the top half of the screen and the uh, and some newer words on the bottom half. If you're using Christian hymns, uh, then it's number 74, at even ere the sun was set, or at evening when the sun had set. So top half will be the new, the older words and the bottom half of the screen, the newer words. So agree in your household which one you're going to sing. And for those who are singing from the book rather than looking at the screen, um, you'll need to leave out verse four. There are seven verses in Christian hymns, but only six verses for the uh, in the newer words. So uh, we're leaving out verse four from the version in Christian hymns. So at even ere the sun was set.
If you'd like to pick up your Bibles again, please. And uh, we're going to read from Jeremiah chapter 14, just the first 12 verses of Jeremiah chapter 14. In the uh, 1984 NIV Bibles, the Church Bibles, it's headed Drought, Famine, Sword. This is the word of the Lord to Jeremiah concerning the drought. Judah mourns, her cities languish, they wail for the land, and a cry goes up from Jerusalem. The nobles send their servants for water, they go to the cisterns, but find no water. They return with their jars unfilled, dismayed and despairing, they cover their heads. The ground is cracked because there is no rain in the land. The farmers are dismayed and cover their heads. Even the doe in the field deserts her newborn fawn because there is no grass. Wild donkeys stand on the barren heights and pant like jackals. Their eyesight fails for lack of pasture. Although our sins testify against us, O Lord, do something for the sake of your name. For our backsliding is great. We have sinned against you. O hope of Israel, its saviour in times of distress, why are you like a stranger in the land, like a traveller who stays only a night? Why are you like a man taken by surprise, like a warrior powerless to save? You are among us, O Lord, and we bear your name. Do not forsake us. This is what the Lord says about his people. They greatly love to wander. They do not restrain their feet. So the Lord does not accept them. He will now remember their wickedness and punish them for their sins. Then the Lord said to me, Do not pray for the well-being of this people. Although they fast, I will not listen to their cry. Though they offer burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Instead, I will destroy them with the sword, famine and plague. Let's come to God in prayer. Let's pray. Dear Lord God, we want to praise you for your great love, for your care, for your compassion, for your mercy, for all the good gifts that we enjoy from your hand. Lord, we have just read a passage that is uh, challenging and makes it sound as though you are a God who is very uh, bleak in the way that you deal with your people and yet we know there is of course a, a background a history to uh, arriving at that point where you had to speak so sternly concerning uh, the people of Judah because of their persistent sin and yet Lord we do know also from scripture that you are a God who delights to show mercy and love and compassion and indeed you are a long-suffering God you are a very patient God and uh, you were so patient with your people back in Jeremiah's day. You had uh, been speaking to them for hundreds of years, drawing them, wanting to draw them back to yourself. And yet in their stubbornness, in their persistence, they rebelled and rejected you. Lord, we thank you that you are a God of love, but you are also a God of justice. And we learn from scripture that there will come a time when your patience comes to an end. Lord, may we take to heart all of these truths. Yes, you are a God of love, but you are also a God of justice. And so it is right that we should fear you in, in a reverential way, that we should have a, a deep respect for you, that we should honour you, that we should seek to love you and obey you. Oh Lord, challenge us, we pray, through your word. We ask for your blessing tonight as we look into the scriptures together. Lord, speak to us and grant us understanding, we pray. Send your Holy Spirit to give us that understanding that we need. Lord, we thank you for um, your undeserved favour, your grace shown towards us as hell-deserving sinners. Lord, we thank you for uh, your generosity and your kindness and goodness to us. Day after day, we find that you renew your blessings and your mercies to us. And uh, we rejoice in that, Lord. Uh, Lord, forgive us that we often take it for granted and help us rather to consciously stop and to think about what it is that you have done for us and then to return our thanks to you and our praise 
because that is your right and indeed is what we should be giving to you. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for your kind and generous dealings with each one of us. Lord, we thank you for your promises. We thank you that in Christ Jesus your promises are yes and amen. They are confirmed and sealed and secured, as it were, uh, through the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we can have complete confidence in you and in the promises that you have made to those who love you and put their trust in you. Lord, we thank you most of all, of course, for your Son, the Lord Jesus, who came into this world to be a saviour for sinners like us, who gave himself up uh, to such a cruel death, uh, but knowing that he was making atonement for the sins of his people. Uh, Lord, we uh, are such great beneficiaries of that. Uh, Lord, we rejoice in the salvation that we know through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for the joys that await us as those who trust in Christ. It is not only for now that we receive your blessings. It is not only every day that we know your mercy is renewed to us, uh, but we have these promises of what lies ahead in eternity. And indeed that time when we will be uh, raised to, to new life uh, with glorious bodies that are like that of the risen Lord Jesus. Uh, and Lord, we read in your word of the promises of heaven and of the new earth as well. And uh, Lord, it is a picture that is painted for us that is so wonderful and uh, really hard to, to, to fathom exactly what that will be like because it can only be described using pictures and uh, um, ideas and images that, that make sense to us at the moment. But um, perhaps it will be such a new experience that, that really it's impossible to describe and Lord may we be excited at that prospect and indeed may that uh, help us to remain faithful to you and be more determined to stand firm and stand fast in the truths of your word as we go through life day by day for we do face difficulties we do face problems we have temptations Lord we it is sad that we need to say that of course we fall into temptation and every day we sin afresh so we need to seek your forgiveness and ask again for your cleansing at this time lord we thank you that you do not deal with us as we deserve uh, lord we pray for uh, the gospel we pray for the good news of the lord jesus that is being proclaimed at this time thank you that the opportunities still exist for us through the internet through recordings through live streaming through um, emails and uh, sharing in all sorts of other ways using modern technology lord we praise you that the gospel is not bound in that sense it is not restricted and limited and we pray very much that you'd be pleased to bless uh, your word as it continues to go forth uh, Lord, we would love to be in our building, we would love to be able to meet together physically, but uh, all the time that that's not possible, we thank you that we can still come together, we can still sing your praises, we can still come in prayer, we can still hear your word being read and indeed of course read it for ourselves, and we can still join together in listening to what you have to say to us through that word. And we still can share the good news of Jesus and we just ask again for your blessing upon that so that uh, anyone who may watch one of our, our service videos or indeed uh, any of the many many services that are available now on the internet we uh, pray for your blessing upon the preaching of your word uh, and the Lord may it be that you will stir people in their hearts because of uh, the unusual situation that we're in and many have been in a sense brought to the end of themselves they uh, perhaps are finding that there is nothing predictable or reliable in the same way as there was even just a few months ago uh, so much has changed and perhaps lord in in these circumstances you will uh, work to point people to yourself to draw people to yourself to help people to realize that they need to base their life on something that is more certain more certain than a than a job that can disappear more certain than an income that can suddenly stop uh, lord we just pray for your blessing then upon the word that is preached and the opportunities that exist to keep sharing the good news lord make us faithful in that help us to be faithful in continuing to look for opportunities to speak of jesus and uh, lord we ask that you would feed us from your word so that we will have a word to share with others 
Lord, be with us tonight and speak to us through your word tonight. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to have another reading from Jeremiah, because I'm hoping to cover quite a bit this evening. And uh, Andy is going to read for us Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 1 to 10. Tonight's reading comes from Jeremiah chapter 17, starting at verse 1. Judah's sin is engraved with an iron tool, inscribed with a flint point on the tablets of their hearts and on the horns of their altars. Even their children remember their altars and ashtoreth poles beside the spreading trees and on the high hills. My mountain in the land and your wealth and all your treasures I will give away as plunder together with your high places because of sin throughout your country. Through your own fault you will lose the inheritance I gave you. I will enslave you to your enemies in a land you do not know for you have kindled my anger. It will burn forever. This is what the Lord says. Cursed is the one who trusts in man, who draws strength from mere flesh, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. That person will be like a bush in the wastelands. They will not see prosperity when it comes. They will dwell in the parched places of the desert, in a land where no one lives. But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream, does not fear when the heat comes, its leaves are always green, has no worries in the year of drought, and never fails to bear fruit. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind to reward each person according to their conduct, according to what their deeds deserve. Amen. Thank you for that reading Andy. Well we're going to sing and if you're using the Christian hymns book at home it's number 348. Father of mercies in your word what endless glories shine forever be your name adored for these celestial lines. It's a hymn of praise to God for giving us his word, giving us the scriptures. Uh, so Father of mercies in your word.
Well, if you'd like to turn uh, in your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 14. Uh, last Sunday evening, we skimmed through just under uh, three and a half chapters of Jeremiah, uh, taking us up to the end of chapter 13. And I want to do the same again this evening, not look at the same passage, but starting from where we left off uh, from chapter 14 and looking at uh, three and a, and a half chapters uh, again, so from 14 through to partway through chapter 17. Last week we thought about the people of Judah's rejection of God's message and their rejection of God's messenger, so that's Jeremiah in particular. And finally we saw God's own rejection of his people, uh, a shocking but sadly inevitable consequence of uh, their persistent disobedience. Uh, they were so determined to ignore God and his word and so God's patience as it were ran out and uh, judgment was going to be brought upon them. God was rejecting his own people. Well the chapters that we're looking at this week um, it probably won't surprise you to hear sadly cover much of the same ground that we've already considered in Jeremiah namely the willful disobedience of the people especially in their pursuit of idolatry and their hypocritical worship and the certainty of God's judgment that was going to come upon the people as a result of their sin. But prompted particularly by some of what we read in chapter 17, I want to look at what is said here from a particular perspective. The title I've chosen for this sermon is this, God knows us better than we know him and ourselves. And I have two points uh, which I've expressed as questions this evening. And the first of those is this. How well do you know God's heart? Well, chapter 14 starts with the Lord giving Jeremiah a word concerning the drought. Now, is this a prophecy concerning a drought that is about to happen? Or is it more of a statement about their current situation? Well, commentators seem to disagree over this. Uh, and for what it's worth, I'm inclined to believe that at this point in time, when this word was given, it was a, probably a prophecy about a drought that was about to, uh, to start. As that seems to me to fit in uh, with what is said by Jeremiah in verses 7 to 9 and subsequently by God in verses 10 to 18. Well, in verses 2 to 6, we have a vivid description of the impact of a drought, and uh, it didn't make for uh, pleasant reading, did it, earlier on? Let me read those verses again. Judah mourns, her cities languish, they wail for the land, and a cry goes up from Jerusalem. The nobles send their servants for water, they go to the cisterns but find no water. They return with their jars unfilled, dismayed and despairing, they cover their heads. The ground is cracked because there is no rain in the land. The farmers are dismayed and cover their heads. Even the doe in the field deserts her newborn fawn because there is no grass. Wild donkeys stand on the barren heights and pant like jackals. Their eyesight fails for lack of pasture. Well, Jeremiah's response in verses 7 to 9 of chapter 14 is perhaps exactly what we would expect from a good and faithful man of God. He seeks to intercede with God for the people. Although our sins testify against us, O Lord, do something for the sake of your name. For ba our backsliding is great. We have sinned against you. O hope of Israel, its saviour in times of distress. Why are you like a stranger in the land, like a traveller who stays only a night? Why are you like a man taken by surprise, like a warrior powerless to save? You are among us, O Lord, and we bear your name. Do not forsake us. The first thing that may come to your mind if you've been following this series through Jeremiah is the fact that we know that Jeremiah has already been told twice that he's not to pray for the people. He isn't to intercede for them. We saw that in chapter 7, verse 16, and in chapter 11, verse 14. But actually, we need to remember that the dating of different parts of Jeremiah is often very difficult. It's certainly not set out in neat chronological order. So we can't actually say for certain that here in chapter 14, Jeremiah should have remembered that he wasn't to intercede for the people, because actually that may not have happened at this point uh, in time. But putting that uncertainty to one side, 
This is what you might call a model intercessory prayer. He acknowledges the sin of the people, verse 7. Our sins testify against us, O Lord. Our backsliding is great. We have sinned against you. He asks God in that same verse to do something for the sake of your name. So he's not saying that they deserve to be rescued, but that God's name and reputation would surely be damaged if the people are allowed to perish. He acknowledges God's goodness to them in the past. At the beginning of verse 8, O hope of Israel, its saviour in times of distress. And at the end of verse 9, he reminds the Lord that the people are his people and that he dwells among them. Probably a reference there, of course, to the temple. But the Lord responds in verses 10 to 12 and 14 to 18 and sets out the case against the people. He tells Jeremiah in verse 11 not to pray for the well-being of the people and makes it very clear in these verses that the people will face God's judgment by sword, famine and plague. And he explains that the prophets who had been assuring the people in the Lord's name that rather than seeing the sword or suffering famine, they would see lying, uh, lasting peace, they were lying. God makes it clear to them that they were lying. They were speaking false visions and delusions and that they themselves, those false, false prophets, would perish by sword and famine, not just the ordinary people of the land. It's a calamity that they deserve says the Lord in verse 16, I will pour out on them the calamity they deserve. Interestingly, from verse 19 to 22, Jeremiah does pray for the people again, despite being told not to in verse 11. Although perhaps you could argue that his angle here isn't that he's praying for the well-being of the people. Rather, he again confesses the wickedness and guilt of the people and their fathers and pleads on the basis of God's name his throne and his covenant in verse 21. For the sake of your name, do not despise us. Do not dishonour your glorious throne, a reference there probably to Jerusalem. Remember your covenant with us and do not break it. His concern is principally for God's glory, it seems, which is surely a good thing, right? You know, surely that's the right way to pray. Well, as I said earlier, I think we would want to encourage many more prayers like this where we focus in our asking, not on ourselves, but on a genuine concern for God's glory and for his name to be honoured and exalted. But look how God continues in chapter 15 with this further response to Jeremiah. Verses 1 and 2 of 15. Then the Lord said to me, even if Moses and Samuel were to stand before me, my heart would not go out to this people. Send them away from my presence. Let them go. And if they ask, where shall we go? Tell them, this is what the Lord says. Those destined for death, to death. Those for the sword, to the sword. Those for starvation, to starvation. Those for captivity, to captivity. And those stark words set the tone for the following verses through to verse 9 and again verses 12 to 14. God stits states the situation very starkly in 15 verse 6. You have rejected me, declares the Lord. You keep on backsliding, so I will lay hands on you and destroy you. I can no longer show compassion. Those are chilling words, aren't they? That God himself should say that to his people. But they are words that reveal God's heart. They reveal God's plan. And Jeremiah, in the light of that, had no business praying against God's will now that it had been revealed so clearly and forcefully to him. When we get to chapter 16, we see in verses 1 to 9 that Jeremiah's actions are to reinforce this message that God's judgment is on its way. So that when people ask him about the coming disaster, verses 10 to 18, he can explain their wickedness and tell them exactly what God has decreed. Verse 13 of chapter 16. So I will throw you out of this land into a land neither you nor your fathers have known. And there you will serve other gods day and night, for I will show you no favour. But look at what God reveals in 16 verses 14 and 15. However, 
The days are coming, declares the Lord, when men will no longer say, as surely as the Lord lives, who brought the Israelites up out of Egypt. But they will say, as surely as the Lord lives, who brought the Israelites up out of the land of the north and out of all the countries where he had banished them. For I will restore them to the land I gave their forefathers. It seems that Jeremiah had made the assumption that God's name would be honoured most by God doing something to prevent disaster coming upon his people. Going back to his prayer in chapter 14, whereas what God is making abundantly clear to Jeremiah is that he's wrong. Because at this point in his eternal plan, in his dealings with the people who bear his name, the greatest glory is going to come to his name through bringing this famine and the sword and the plague on his people and through sending most of the survivors into exile in distant lands. But after a period of time, he is going to bring the survivors back. And of course, God knew that his plan of bringing judgment against the people before showing mercy and restoring them to the land that he'd given to their forefathers was going to bring greater glory to his name, as well, of course, as teaching important lessons to his people and to us today more then than relenting yet again in Jeremiah's dispatch day, despite their centuries of backsliding. Jeremiah needed to learn that his assumption about what would be most honouring to God in this situation was wrong. Depending on when exactly these events occurred, it may be that God had already made clear to Jeremiah, possibly uh, several times, that his judgment was definitely going to fall upon the people, and if so, then presumably in continuing to plead with God, he still struggled to accept this. And on a personal level too, poor Jeremiah struggled greatly with trying to come to terms with what God was doing. If you look back at chapter 15, verses 15 to 21, you'll see how Jeremiah has uh, what you might call a bit of a wobble uh, as he considers his own suffering as the people oppose him and reject God's call through him to repent and return to him. Let me read those verses. You understand, O Lord, remember me and care for me. Avenge me on my persecutors. You are long-suffering. Do not take me away. Think of how I suffer reproach for your sake. When your words came, I ate them reminds us of Ezekiel. They were my joy and my heart's delight, for I bear your name, O Lord God Almighty. I never sat in the company of revellers, never made merry with them. I sat alone because your hand was on me and you had filled me with indignation. Why is my pain unending and my wound grievous and incurable? Will you be to me like a deceptive brook, like a spring, that fails? That's incredibly strong language. In fact, Jeremiah is so low that it sounds like he's just a whisker away from saying that the Lord God Almighty is actually no better than a worthless idol, one who can be relied on about as much as a stream in the desert that dries up almost as soon as it's appeared. No wonder that the Lord says that what he does in verse 19 before repeating the words of Jeremiah's original commissioning from chapter 1, verses 17 to 19. Therefore, this is what the Lord says. If you repent, so of what he has just said, almost comparing God with a worthless idol, I will restore you that you may serve me. If you utter worthy, not worthless words, you will be my spokesman. Let this people turn to you but you must not turn to them, which either means you've got to wait until they come and confess their sin, or it means you're not allowed to sink to their level. You mustn't go and end up agreeing with them. I will make you a wall to this people, a fortified wall of bronze. They will fight against you, but will not overcome you, for I am with you to rescue and save you, declares the Lord. I will save you from the hands of the wicked and redeem you from the grasp of the cruel and that's those verses really are a repetition of his commissioning in chapter one 
So Jeremiah, in his struggles, both personally and for the people of Judah, needed to be reminded that he did not know everything that was in the mind of God or the heart of God. And he needed to learn to trust fully in God's love for him and, yes, to trust that God was indeed doing what was right and best for the sake of his name, for his glory. Now we've covered a lot of ground so far, but I hope that you've begun to realise that there is at least one very clear application that arises from Jeremiah's struggles and prayers. And the question posed in this first section heading is an attempt to point us in the right direction. How well do you know God's heart? To put it another way, what assumptions are you in danger of making about God and about what God is doing, either in this world in general or in other people's circumstances or indeed in your own life in particular? And in what ways do those potential assumptions, potential wrong assumptions, impact on how you pray and what you pray for? If God has revealed his heart, his plans, his will to us through his word, then we have every reason to pray in line with those. And we can do so with great confidence and with boldness even. But equally, if the Lord has shown us that something is not his will, is not right, is not pleasing to him, then we have no business praying against that, praying contrary to that. So it's obvious, I hope, that one implication of this is that we should want to get to know what God has revealed to us of his will. And that means we need to read God's word. We need to read the Bible. The Bible is essential for us to grow to maturity in Christ and for us to become more and more fruitful and more and more informed as to what God's will is for us so that we can pray aright. But there will be a multitude of things, particularly with regard to specific details in our lives, in which God has not made his will known to us in direct terms. Which means not only are we able to pray in very free terms about those things, but actually we're also able to take decisions for ourselves with confidence. But that's another topic altogether, so I won't uh, carry on down that path for now. In all of this, we need to be careful not to make assumptions that we know what would bring most glory to God. In other words, ending up telling God what he ought to do, even when we couch it in kind of ever so humble terms. You know, we might reason, well, would it not bring great joy and glory to God to save everyone in Reed Court Road? and then bring them along to uh, our services when we are able to meet again in hopefully the not too distant future. Well, I think we could confidently say, yes, it would bring glory to God. But is that what is in the Lord's heart to do? Well, I don't know. And he hasn't revealed that to us. So while we can pray with boldness and confidence that he would be pleased to save many, because we do know that he is patient, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance, as we read in 2 Peter 3 verse 9. But we do need to acknowledge that God knows best in terms of what will result in his greater glory. And indeed what he is doing and working out as part of his whole plan. You know, we tend to focus on one tiny part, the bit that impinges on us. Well, her, you know, we don't know what God may be doing and how our part fits in with a bigger picture. And so it's worth saying, actually, that it's never a cop-out to include in our prayers a phrase like, if it's your will, O Lord. Our Saviour himself prayed in that way. So don't ever let anyone tell you that it's a cop-out or that it shows you have no real faith if you include in your prayer if that's your will, Lord. Actually, when we say it thoughtfully and carefully, with confident and bold prayers, it's a humble admission that it is not for you or me to say what is in the Lord's heart and what his will is in that particular thing that we're praying for. What God has revealed to us of his heart, in terms of his mercy, his love, his grace, his compassion, 
which we'll see more and more of as we get to know our Bibles, should certainly, yes, give us confidence and boldness to pray to God, to act in accordance with those aspects of his character. But remember that God says in Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. But much more briefly now, having asked, how well do you know God's heart? I want to ask a second question. How well does God know your heart? At the beginning of chapter 17, God says this, Judah's sin is engraved with an iron tool, inscribed with a flint point, on the tablets of their hearts and on the horns of their altars. God was about to act in judgment against his people precisely because he knew what their hearts were like. They were indelibly engraved with sin, which impacted on every part of their conduct, including their hypocritical worship. They alone were to blame for their imminent downfall. We see that in verse 4 of chapter 17. Through your own fault, you will lose the inheritance I gave you. They were under God's curse, as we see in verse 5 of chapter 17. This is what the Lord says. Cursed is the one who trusts in man, who depends on flesh for his strength, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. And the Lord knew that in their hearts they had turned away from him. It's a sentiment repeated in verse 13 of that chapter. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you will be put to shame. Those who turn away from you will be written in the dust because they have forsaken the Lord, the spring of living water. It's language that reminds us of the drought that's mentioned in chapter 14, I think. So how well does God know your heart, my heart? In a word, intimately. He knows what darkness lurks there. And you may recall that Jesus speaks about the truth that it isn't what we eat that makes us unclean before God, but rather what comes out of the mouth and that out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks, as Jesus says in Matthew 12, verse 34. In the language of the Bible, it is in our hearts that sin lives and thrives. Look at verse 9, which is probably one of the most well-known verses in the book of Jeremiah. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? That's quite an indictment, isn't it? If you look carefully, you'll notice that in the NIV, it doesn't have uh, inverted commas around it, speech marks around this verse. The translators have chosen to interpret this verse as being spoken not by God, but by Jeremiah. Uh, other versions treat this as a continuation of what the Lord says, so from verse 5, ending either at the end of verse 10 or verse 11. Either way, it is a true observation. With the only one who can understand our hearts, the only one who can truly know them, being God himself. Verse 10, I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind to reward a man according to his conduct, according to what his deeds deserve. We need to think really carefully about the implications of those truths that are stated there, that the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Because it is deceitful, we need to be very careful Yes, even about trusting our own hearts. Follow your heart. How often have you heard people say that? That seems to be one of the kind of standard things that young people are told these days. Follow your heart. Follow your dreams. Well, at the very least, we should be very cautious about what our hearts want. And in fact, some would say uh, that as it's deceitful, you shouldn't trust your own heart any more than you could, any further than you could throw an elephant. In other words, you really shouldn't trust it at all. The, this truth means that whenever we find a mismatch between our, what our hearts say, what our hearts desire, what our hearts want, and what God tells us in his word, then we must let God be true and every man a liar, as Paul says in Romans 3 verse 4. 
That is, obviously, we must follow God's word, trust God's word above trusting our hearts. Now, there will be some who will tell you that that's uh, madness. But actually, that is what God calls us to do, because he knows our hearts better than we do. He knows that they are deceitful above all things and beyond cure. It underlines how necessary it is that we get to know God's word. Even more challenging is this truth that our hearts are beyond cure or incurably bad or desperately sick or desperately wicked. There's various ways that that phrase is translated. But the consistent witness of Scripture is that we are unable to fix the problem of our sinful hearts ourselves. And Jeremiah recognises this, actually, when you look a bit further on it to verse 14. Heal me, O Lord, and I will be healed. Save me, and I will be saved. For you are the one I praise. You see, this knowledge of the fact that our heart is beyond cure and that it is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Uh, this must drive us to God, who is the only one who is able and indeed is willing to heal our sin-sick hearts. Because they're deceitful, even as you're watching this uh, video, part of you may well be saying, don't listen to him. But that's the mistake the people of Judah made, of course. And so they suffered God's judgment. What can we say in conclusion as we've thought about these truths? Well, we need to read God's word. That's one of the strongest thing, I think, that comes to me from this passage of the fact that uh, we don't know what God's heart is in many things. And he knows what is in our hearts. But the more we read God's word, the more we commune with God in prayer, the more we will get to know God's heart better. And indeed, get to know our own hearts better as well. And then we will be able to pray more boldly and confidently. Yet all the while with humility, of course. Because it will always be the case that he knows us better than we know ourselves. And that he knows what will bring greatest glory to himself. And indeed, greatest joy for us. Whether in his dealings with us personally or with our friends and our family, and in all that God is doing in the world. We need to be honest with ourselves. God knows our hearts intimately. Every thought, every desire, every motive, the bad as well as the good. So there's nothing we can hide from God. In fact, it's, he knows more, as I've said, than we do. He knows we need new hearts, and he offers one through repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the glorious good news, the Christian gospel, that it is possible for us to experience a, a new birth, to be given a new heart, so that the deceitful heart can begin to die away. And it comes through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, believing that he lived that perfect life in our place and died bearing the punishment that we deserve because of the sin that is in our own hearts. And this goes for all who profess to be Christians too, in terms of God's knowledge, better knowledge of our hearts than we have of ourselves. He sees all that we're hiding from our brothers and sisters in Christ, and we can be often very good at that. But we can't hide anything from God because he knows what our hearts are like. He sees those darkest recesses of our hearts. He knows me better than I know myself, I can say. Actually, Cliff Richard sang a song about that. If you're a Cliff Richard fan, you might be able to remember that. Um, look it up. But read, read Hebrews 4, verse 13. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. That's a chilling truth, isn't it? Our own hearts will be completely laid bare before God. The verse before that talks about God's word. And you see, reading God's word will help us not only to see God's heart, 
and to understand more of his will so that we can pray more confidently and boldly in line with that will, but also what God sees in our hearts as God's word reveals those truths to us. Now that is a painful process because it will show us to be sinners in need of God's mercy, God's forgiveness. But if we read it and if we take that to heart and act upon it, we can go to God in repentance and faith. Yes, it's a painful process, but it's worth it. Well, may God give us the desire and the courage to engage with these truths, to acknowledge that we do not know all that is in God's heart. So we need to pray, yes, with boldness, but with humility, all the time getting to know God through his word so that we can know his heart better, but also reading God's word so that we may know our own hearts better and always remember uh, that there is a deceitfulness that will, the stain of that, I think, will stay there right through our Christian lives. So the most mature of Christians will always be careful because they will remember this truth. The heart is deceitful above all things and they will walk carefully in the light of that truth. Well, may God help us to understand and take these things uh, to heart, as it were. Amen going to sing a couple of songs as we come to a close. Uh, the first one is a very short one. Uh, in Christian hymns it's 931. Search me, O God, and know my heart today. Try me, O Lord, and know my thought, I pray. See if there be some wicked way in me. Cleanse me from every sin and set me free. It seemed to me a bit an appropriate prayer to sing at the end of that uh, having had a look at the, uh, those passages in Jeremiah. And we're going to follow that immediately by another hymn. All of us in sin were dying, all in Adam had a share. All our dreams and tears and trying only deepened our despair. In this hopeless situation, how impossible our case. All stood under condemnation. None could help or take our place. And the hymn goes on, of course, to show us that there is an answer and it is found in the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, there's a, a mention in this hymn, of course, of the deceitfulness of the heart as well. It ties in, I felt, with uh, what we've been looking at tonight.
Let's pray. Lord, your word has revealed truths to us that may be very uncomfortable for us. Lord, perhaps, as uh, so many do in this world, we've made assumptions about you, about what you're like, about uh, how you should behave in, uh, as far as we're concerned. Uh, some would see that you are just a God of love and so you should always do uh, what's good and right by us. Uh, but Lord, uh, of course that is not the case and uh, we pray that you would help us to have uh, a proper, uh, humble and respectful understanding of your greatness and the fact that uh, we do not know all of your thoughts, indeed cannot. Uh, but we thank you that you've given us your word and through reading the scriptures we can get to know you. There is more and more of your heart, as it were, that we can uh, become familiar with as we read the scriptures. But it is a, a lifelong task. And even then we will only, as it were, have scratched the surface. Uh, so Lord, may we never make assumptions about uh, what's, uh, how you should act, uh, how you should answer our prayers, what would give you greatest glory. Lord, it's not for us to say that. So help us to uh, be humble before you particularly in the light of that truth that our hearts are deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Lord, we need to look to you for a new heart and we need to look to you for a proper uh, understanding of our own um, sinfulness so that we do not place our confidence in ourselves or in our own hearts, but rather in you and in the gospel and in the Lord Jesus Christ. Please help us to get these things straight in our heads and to have a, a respectful and right understanding of these things. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and for evermore. Amen. Thank you for joining with us this evening and I uh, hope uh, we'll, uh, you'll join us again next Sunday.